Okay, so let's get started. Um, the next talk is about resource management and offloaded switches. It's uh, actually work done by an intern that worked at, works at Cumulus Networks called Andy. And, uh, and uh, I'll be doing the presentation because Andy is not here. And in preparation for this talk, I've learned two lessons from previous uh, masters. From Eric Dumaze, I've learned how to give a talk for somebody else and make sure that all the good things are attributed to me and all the mistakes are attributed to Andy. And from Harald, I've learned that the right dress code is all black, but just like my talk, I'm almost there. I'm, it's going to be almost as good. That's sort of where we are going to end up. Um, so a little bit of an introduction about the topic itself. Um, Cumulus, as people may or may not know, spends a lot of time taking Linux, the kernel, the networking model, and accelerating it on switches. We run on a vi very, very wide variety of devices from multiple vendors, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that we've always run into, and we've always had problems with, and that's what this, this talk is about, is how do you reflect hardware resource capability as part of the offload conversation to every component and vendor, uh, sorry, component and member that needs to know about it. So let's get some taxonomy right, right? So this is a very sophisticated picture, and hopefully you can see it out in the back. Um, the components that matter, right? There is almost always some user space control plane daemon, something that's implementing a protocol. You always have the Linux kernel, and the kernel, like it should, always has some data structure that represents a resource, and we'll call it so for now. Um, and typically, you have a device driver that is now synchronizing the state of that table with some table in the hardware. And this is clearly specific to the use case that Cumulus worries about the most. The packet path, the way data flows, is through that hardware table. So the problem, in some sense, is defined as the synchronization between the kernel representation of the table and the hardware's representation of the table. One thing I'd make sure, I want to make sure everybody understands and re remembers is that those two tables are not the same. The way they're represented, the attributes they can carry, their capabilities that they can express are fundamentally different. So what are the steps in this model that can fail, right? So typically, the updates from the control plane to the kernel are synchronous, right? You have various examples of that. You have ETH tool, you have the netlink commands, and so on and so forth. And the caller expects to know right there and then whether the callee is going to be able to support the call that was just made, i.e., whether the callee is the kernel. Uh, batching has effects, right? For efficiency, you almost always want to send n number of something to the kernel. And clearly, that's a problem because you, if you fail one out of n and the failure happens to be in the middle, then how do you signal? Do you roll back the whole thing? Do you selectively fail some? So on and so forth. And the second question, and sort of one of the aspects that matter is, since the kernel is a relatively monolithic component, if you make a change, how do you disperse that change to every user space implementation out there, which also involves forward and backward compatibility concerns? And then there are the opposite, which is an update from the kernel to hardware. Not the opposite, it's sort of the next step, right? As, so the first step is getting data from there into that table. The second is getting it from that table to that table. So the first problem with that second step, when you're getting from there, as the picture shows, is that the, cap the capacity and the capabilities might be mismatched. There might be rate issues. The kernel might be able to sync data at memory bandwidth rates, whereas let's say for the sake of argument, if you're downloading to hardware over an I2C bus, it's like squeezing it into a modem, right? So you squeeze in too much, it's going to start having problems. And then you have type mismatches. The kernel, uh, if you think about routing as an example, uses very simple types of route distinguishers. It's v4 or it's v6, and the rest is sort of within the structures. In hardware, the actual length of a prefix is a very important thing. And it might say that a v4 address and a v6 slash 64 are housed in the same spot. So the way the kernel calls capacity might be very different from the way the hardware calls capacity. So if those are the problems, or the, so those are the steps that can fail, what are the types of failures you can have? 
The worst, and everybody's favorite, is the silent failure. You told me to do something, I just decided not to do it and sit on my hands. This has real problems, and we'll talk about that in subsequent slides. So one of the most problematic ones is that the kernel table updated, the hardware table did not update. So the packet, when the packet is doing its lookup, is getting a result which is different from what the user thinks the result is going to be. And the control plane is therefore uh, oblivious to that. The other kind of failure is advertised failures. But the advertised failures might be asynchronous, or almost always will be asynchronous. Now this creates a burden on the user space app, because the user space app now has to have some ability to say, I know I move my state forward, but I need to come back and clean it up and revert something that I've already done and maybe have advertised to the rest of the world. And we'll talk more about that with a specific example in a second. And we didn't talk about the synchronous failure model here because it's covered later. So let's look at what this means from an act actual example perspective. And this is a little bit dense, and it's got a lot of information, so I'm going to try and talk slowly and point to things. And if it's not clear, this is actually a good time to just raise your hand and say, I didn't get that, and, and we'll go talk about it more. So this is in this example, what you have is you have a host, uh, which is not shown here, that's attached to this link under this router R2. And let's say. Our, this router R1 is connected to the outside world, so this is your capital I internet, and you have a device under test. So we call it the device under test because it's a router that is going to be the emphasis and the focal point for our discussion uh, going forward. So what you have here is this, this router over here is saying that it has the path to reach 13000 slash 24. So anybody in this subnet over here will be reachable will be able to reach the internet or will be reachable from the internet through R1, through the DUT, through R2, and out here. And the expectation is that R2 has advertised this capability to this device under test. And subsequently, this router has told R1 that a path exists to get to, get to this 13000 subnet. That's the setup. Um, do I need to cover something else? OK, so that's that's where we are. Now consider the case that for whatever reason, this guy, this DUT, while it took the route advertisement from here, it failed to inject the route, the hardware route, for 13000 slash 24 into the hardware table. But the control plane that is oblivious to that fact, to that failure, has advertised this route up to R1. So R1 amongst all the ways that it thinks it can get to that host that's attached down here, is now saying, oh, I know the way I can to get to that host is through DUT, because I have seen an advertisement coming from below. However, I also have a default route. And because in hardware, the route never got installed, all packets that are destined towards that host down here are hitting the DOT, not getting hardware forwarded because the prefix doesn't exist, and is being shunted down here and is going into a deep, dark, black hole. And as the slide says, happiness and joy is felt all around. Now just think about this for a second, right? A situation like this is actually highly, highly problematic. No network debugging tool is going to be able to tell you that you're in this condition. What you're going to see is random sporadic outage because that particular prefix might get withdrawn at some point and might get reinserted. And depending on the statistical setup of the table at that point, it might succeed. So suddenly you go, oh, I hit return, and I can reach the internet again. Great, problem solved. While your neighbor is now going to start screaming because suddenly his or her host is unreachable. This is a very big problem. And, and the reason why this problem is, is highlighted in networking is it's, not, it's no longer a box problem. The problem has leapt from a box effect to a system-wide effect, and it's very hard to nail down. And, and while we are on this topic, let's understand the implication of solving it. Right. So we'll, clearly, the rest of this talk is going to talk about some things that we are looking at about how to solve this particular problem. Um, 
But to solve this problem correctly, not only would the hardware and the kernel indicate correctly to the, to the routing protocol or the protocol demons that there has been a failure, the protocol demons themselves have to have some ability to go and withdraw routing or withdraw the routes and tell the neighbors that this is no longer possible. So if you look at the state of the art today, uh, we, we at Cumulus use this thing called FRR, which is a fork off of Quagga, which is, I would argue, the most commonly used routing suite on the internet today. Um, and in that, in, in FRR, what you see is that the route from, the failed route from the DUT will be shown as an inactive route. However, R1 will still see the advertisement, and even if the kernel did everything absolutely perfectly today, you would still end up in this deep dark hole. And we are working on fixing that because it is a thing that we believe is hugely influential to getting the networking model right and to the point where networking gets out of sort of the deep dark arts to something that just works. And by that I mean uh, infrastructure networking, not the host networking at which Linux has excelled for many years now. So how bad is this problem? Like how bad can this problem be? It's clearly not a big deal because no one's talking about it, so therefore it must be a, a tiny uh, portion of the problem space that is known to man. So if you look at this picture up here, it's, uh, this is a, a hugely generalized implementation of what a networking device pipeline would look like, right? It's, it's fairly straightforward. And I, as I look around the room, I know that everybody in this room who's got an ASIC or a, or a pipeline architecture is looking at this picture and saying, wow, that's completely wrong because my pipeline looks different. Um, and you're all right. However, I think you can squint your eyes and say, at a very high level, this is, these are the stages at which things are looked up. There's an L2 lookup with any ACLs that might be uh, applicable. There's an L3 lookup with ACLs that might be ac applicable. Once the L3 has, has uh, given up a destination, a way to get to its destination, you'll have some egress ACLs and so on and so forth. In between, as part of the lookup, you'll have something, some kind of uh, LPM engine that will give you the L3 lookup, and you'll have some kind of a TCAM that will give you the, the Mac, VLAN, VNI lookup uh, for the L2 lookup. So the point, however, is that in this picture, there are five gross tables. In reality, it's actually almost always way more complex than that. And each of those tables right now are subject to this class of problems, and we'll talk about them uh, one by one, but this is basically the point, that this is an issue that can cause failures in wide and amazing ways, and almost all the innovation that you can do in this space is going to hurt you. So what is the state of the art for resource management in the kernel today, right? So ACLs, let's talk about how ACLs are implemented. Clearly, uh, a networking operator's definition of an ACL, an access control list, is a little bit different from how people who are implementing networking on hosts, virtual switches, virtual routers, container networking, looks at it. And uh, if you think about, today, about it today, you have net filter offload is not really very easy. It's not, there is no clean, simple, structured path that gives you deterministic offload behavior. Uh, it's implemented via this NDO setup TC. In fact, it was talked about in, uh, in Romy's talk yesterday, so we'll, we'll skip it for the most part. But for a switch, for a, for a device that is sitting on the fast path, and, and I want to actually maybe paint this picture a little bit. When what I call a switch, what an enterprise device would look like is switching somewhere in the order of, let's say, 1.8 terabits and above at any given time. There's no way you're going to be moving that kind of data to any CPU and be able to afford the CPU you would need to be able to handle the bandwidth. Right? So effectively, these are problem scenarios where either the hardware is going to do the right thing or it's going to completely mess up. There is no way for the CPU to step in and say, oh, I know there's something wrong here, but I'll be able to take the back pressure and deal with it over time. So. For a, for a switch of that class, the, using the definition I just used, you could say if there's a problem with the ACL table, the ACL doesn't exist or whatever, punt all the packets to the CPU. That's highly impractical because, as I said, the CPU that you need to be able to do 1.8 terabits or, or more, actually 3.2 is kind of the, 
de facto standard today and 6.4 is on its way. So mm -hmm. if you talk about being able to handle that kind of bandwidth in, a, in like the most the biggest x86 class CPU you can find, you're talking about basically a server that's more expensive than you can afford to put in place of that switch. So if you consider that a problem, then you say, okay, so punt to the CPU is really not an option, and it's highly impractical. You could say that I will only do, like I will make sure that the ACLs are perfectly implemented in software for the control plane. Yeah, that's great. So you'll, you'll protect the control plane. But again, there's a security hole, because now, Imagine the case where you are a bank and you have certified ACLs that need to be downloaded and installed such that you can get your whatever security clearances implemented and you cannot guarantee that all your ACLs will be in hardware. You don't want to be the security officer over there signing that, that statement and saying, no, no, don't worry about it, it's all fine. The second class of... Uh, such tables would be the MAC table or the FDB and FDB table as as it's all uh, is, as it's called in the kernel. Um, L2 is a little bit more forgiving, right? The worst case situation with the L2 table is you're going to just flood. On a single host, very annoying, but probably not fatal. If you have, like we were talking about in the talk that Jamal gave yesterday, 100,000, 150,000 MACs in your system, Flooding everywhere will bring your network to its knees. And again, not practical for, for those applications. Uh, almost all hardware has something called flood control, so you could actually get by with this. So L2, in, in the grand scheme of things, the L2 table is probably the one that you will worry about the least. Another table that matters a lot from that picture before is the neighbor table, or what's called the directly connected host table. Typically, again, not an issue because it's, you know, it's limited. There is only so many neighbors you can directly connect to a given box. So that typically is not uh, an issue. One of the biggest problems is the L, oh, sorry, no, this is L3 configuration. This is not the LPM yet. There are, there are issues here potentially, but they are almost all livable with, right? Like uh, things that you worry about are like, is there a VRF? Is there a VXLAN? And why these things matter is because depending on the hardware that you're using, when you create a WRF or you create a VXLAN interface and you're going to do routing over that VXLAN interface, you might have to go reserve capabilities that, were, uh, that are not obvious. Sometimes you have to go, like if you're going to do VXLAN routing or if you're going to put an SVI, a, a router virtual interface on a bridge, you're going to have to go reserve some capabilities for routing. You're going to have to reserve some next hop table, you're going to have to reserve some um, L3 interface entries, and so on and so forth. And those things can fail. And again, the kernel thinks you're able to do routing over VXLAN network, but what has happened is underneath you, some critical resource has not been allocated. And either you're going to be able to clean up correctly, or you're going to fail the device creation in a very coherent and deterministic way, but the worst case scenario is where the, the kernel's view of the world and the hardware's view of the world are, not, are no longer in sync. And from here on out, all results are going to be confusing. Uh, yeah, OK. So there are tables, tables everywhere. How do we protect them all? And by the way, I, I am talking about this in the context of, of hardware switches. But um, as has been mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, um, one of the hottest topics at this conference and in Linux right now is SmartNICs. And a SmartNIC is nothing in my mind but a small switch with the one luxury that the CPU can come in and help. However, it doesn't get absolved from this problem that we are talking about, which is if there's a failure in the kernel to hardware interface, the result of that failure has to be highly deterministic and there should be a well-agreed-to plan as to how to deal with it. OK, so what is needed is a consistent offload failure path to the user or protocol daemon, a signaling from kernel to user space of the resource utilization and the capacity, and a, a resource manager model or a resource management algorithm. Um, OK, uh, uh, yeah, so and, and you know, basically the notion of driver profiles. And this actually is right now being pushed into the into switch dev. There's a bunch of work that Mellanox is doing to make this into something that becomes a de facto standard. 
and is sort of a step, is, is a big step in the right direction, right? It's, it's what you have to do. You have to come in and say, here are sort of the general outlines of how, given a highly configurable device, I want to sort of set the bookends of how resources are carved out. You have to start there. Anything less than that is, I mean, you're writing PhD theses to figure out how and how many of a particular resource you have. Um, another simple solution is to do tri abort, and this actually was also tri sort of there was a fledgling implementation in SwitchDev and has been withdrawn since, which is uh, I think it was called the two st two step transaction model or so on and so forth, where you do a try, see if the hardware can actually support what you want, and then come back and say, oh, sorry, it didn't work. We are going to abort this and go go ahead from there. The problem with tri abort is. Um, uh, there are multiple problems with tribot, but the single largest one is that you're still basically dealing with a very static model. You cannot, you don't have the ability and you don't have the time budget to be able to do a complex analysis. So if you're looking at a relatively simple implementation, you can't, you cannot make it more sophisticated. And, and if you look at at least what's happening in, in the switch class of devices now, most of the tables are no longer TCAMs. They're not hard limits. They're all algorithmic. The, which means the hash, uh, the efficiency of the hash and the occupancy of the hash function will change based on what input you're getting. And so, so there is a dynamic evaluation component that becomes more complicated. And the tribot model will work, actually will work amazingly, as long as, like I was saying earlier, the whole stack implements it. All the way from user space down to the last uh, n level, everybody needs to know that the call that I'm about to make might fail. And then you can move the abort all the way to the top of the stack. This is, I mean, very standard, right? Like anybody who's used any programming language with like a try-fail or try-abort, you can't just implement it at the lower level and then leave the upper layer ob oblivious. You have to move it all the way up, and new pipelines have to be built such that that communication goes all the way up to the top. So, so, the, for the last portion of the talk, we're going to talk about some experiments we did and, and propose a solution that uh, we hacked together. All of the work was done using the Mellanox driver in, uh, in I guess, a 414 kernel. I'm looking for, yeah, I'm looking for a confirmation from David. Um, and, uh, and, you know, all the code is up there. Actually, if you look at, ah, there's an interesting sub-bullet on this slide, which needs to be fixed, which says actual code changes are here. Um, what was supposed to be there is a real GitHub pointer. And uh, if you look at the paper, the paper has the references. There's a GitHub repo. Everything that we are talking about today is, is available. Um, you can try this experiment at home. I should say that these experiments were conducted by professional stuntmen. And, uh, and there, is, there is a risk to trying this at home. But um, So if you, if you look at this picture, and I don't know if this is readable. It, it's a lot more readable on on my screen. Uh, what this is saying is there is a user space tool that's creating the routing information base, the rib. And if you look at the path, this is user land, this is kernel, this is route, router device. There are three loops that you need to worry about, right? There's a loop that user space is pushing the rib into the fib, which is the kernel's forwarding information base. There's a second loop where that data is being pushed into a device driver and effectively into the the third loop is the device driver pushing it into the ASIC, right? So, and if you think of them as three sort of uh, uh, servo loops, then it's easy to characterize the problem we are trying to solve and how to measure whether a given problem solves or given solution solves the problem or not. So, like I said, the first one is user space kernel interaction loop. The second is a kernel to device driver loop. And the third is device driver to the actual ASIC. What we did is we simulated number three by rather than actually going and doing the complex calculations that would be needed for the Mellanox hardware, we just said that uh, we we're going to put a simple U-sleep and that at the end of U-sleep, we are going to give you in a binary form, a certain number of resources have been consumed by hardware. That's it. That's the test. Um, we made another change that we put a synchronous check of the query result in the fib notifier path. So in the device driver, the IPv4 event handler, we put in an additional check that says, when you're about to go accept 
the, the FIB notifier update, either I have space or I don't have space. And I, that check is now in line. And it's a very fast check, whereas Jasper, he's going to tell me a very simple counter check is not fast, actually. But let's assume it is for the sake of argument. And since it's a device driver thing, you don't pay that price unless you're using that particular device in the path. But if you have the device driver be able to do that synchronously, so all, all that's going to happen is when uh, uh, entry, let's say it's an IP route ad that gets, that pushes a route into the FIB, the FIB will invoke the notifier. The device driver that has the notifier receiver, if you will, is going to now go and say, do I have the space to accept this update? If the answer is no, I'm going to fail it. And this path will go fail, fail right away. Or I'm going to say I have the space and I'll go ahead and accept it. Asynchronous to that, or synchronous, actually we have both examples, we will say hardware has, going, has informed the device driver that the updates that you had staged for me have been consumed by me and I have so much or so many resources free for you to consume going forward. That's sort of the, the going forward model. So we looked at two implementations. And uh, actually, we looked at many implementations. There are only two that, uh, two or three we are going to talk about explicitly. So the first one is lockstep, right? This is the easiest one to do. Every call is going to go through and, in a lockstep manner, tell me whether or not that entry could have been accepted in hardware or not. There is no, you know, this is how you establish baselines. And it's a good way to write a paper, right? You basically want to know what your absolute worst case operations are going to be. So this loop is executed explicitly in series, right? So you, you get this update, you get this update, you get this update. We then uh, considered a second, mo uh, second model, which we call the synchronous prefetch. And effectively, it takes the lockstep model and says, this check, instead of being one by one, we're going to, every time you ask us, we're going to also ask for five more resources from hardware. So we have a little bit of skid so that the next five, or the next 10, or the next 1,000, it's a configurable number, will not have to go to hardware to find out whether hardware would be able to pass or fail it. So you have a little bit of a headroom, right? You're, you're, you're amortizing over n number of calls. And the latency is amortized as well. And the last solution we looked at was a credit-based prefetch model, which We'll tell you, we'll hide latency, checks the capacity and rate, asynchronous update of availability, matches capacity and rate, and needs an atomic add from the async thread. So let me say that maybe, again, slower. In, in this model, what we do is, when the FIP goes to the, de the device driver, the device driver will tell you whether or not it has resources. But its resource is not a single resource, nor is it a bucket, or nor, nor is it a list. It's a bucket of resources. So you have some, you have basically a, a, a prefetched, if you consider the previous example, a prefetched set of capacity. And you're going to consume from that prefetched set of capacity. And this capacity will be refreshed asynchronously by a separate kernel thread, which is reflecting the hardware doing its calculations and saying, OK, I think I can take n more routes going forward. And what this allows you to do is that it allows you to match both the rate and the capacity of the hardware. So by shrinking or growing the bucket size, you can say that I will not take updates at a greater than x rate. And the total summation of all the bucket sizes, so let's say, let's take a real example, right? Let's say you said, um, I have a 4K entry hardware table. And I'm trying to update 4K. And what we said is that the, in the device driver, the bucket size is 1,000 entries. And the update is at 100. So you can take, basically, you can take bursts of 100 entries at a time. You can gather up to 1,000 entries before you know that I cannot take one more entry without asking hardware that it has the capacity or not, and so on and so forth. People will recognize this, this solution as something that a lot of high-speed computer buses do as a way to make sure that two of the, the two ends are, talk, are continuing to talk to each other, but are not able, able to overwhelm the other end of the wire. 
where am I going? So, and, and we ran a bunch of experiments, and this is basically what the experiment uh, is. So you, you'll recognize this portion of the picture from what we did previously. And fundamentally what we are doing is we are measuring once this happens, so we are taking this R2 path, we are causing R2 to break, which means the, all the routes have to be updated such that it's now going to swing to the R3 path and traffic from R1 to R4 or to the host behind R4 is going to be, re uh, is going to be restored. Right, so the reason, okay, maybe I should say a few more words before that. What we tried to do was, if we were to inject this into the current path, if we were to inject this mechanism into the current path of updating hardware resources, what is the impact and what do you get out of it? So we wanted to do some measurements to see what that means and this is what it is. So what we did was, to repeat then, um, we put in traffic that was coming from above R1 aimed for this host 13001 behind R4, and traffic was running through this path, through R2, and when we broke the link, we caused a full route install on R3, and we measured what that time was, so that we see what happens. So, uh, and I, I noticed that in the slides, I forgot to add one important number. So what we measured was that a single write to hardware was about 55 um, microseconds, if I, or 60 microseconds, I think, what we used here. Uh, we measured that, it's rough. I'm sure some Mellanox person will tell me it's way lower than that, but for this experiment, let's say that's the number. So it's 60 microseconds to get a route all the way from user space into hardware. And if you remember, we said we put in a sleep to indicate when hardware can indicate that a particular transaction aimed towards the hardware has, been con has actually landed or not. So the lockstep experiment, we basically said that, uh, oh, okay, so we are going to send 10,000 uh, routes. So there are 10,000 routes. The last of those routes is what triggers the path to become available. So we know that if, if the, a host here can reach a host here, the 10,000th route has made it into hardware, and hardware can now forward packets. Right? So, so far, so good. So what you see is that if you have 10,000 routes and you do lockstep, such that you can guarantee that hardware will never accidentally tell you that it could do something that it couldn't, your latency is 600 milliseconds. This is relatively easy, right? You multiply those two numbers and you get that number. Straightforward. Um, we see that at 600 milliseconds latency, the actual outage, because that's the thing that really matters, was about 1.1 seconds. That's, that's how long it took between a host that was able to reach this guy through this path losing this link, switching over, getting all the 10,000 routes installed, and restoring traffic. Then we looked at the credit-based scheme. We saw that because the credit-based scheme doesn't do the lockstep, it doesn't do the one-to-one, one -one, there are a couple of setup and teardown events that make this number marginally better, right? It's about 13% better. So there is the law of physics, right? We are doing 10,000 of those. But clearly, this 60 microseconds has some setup and teardown overhead, which is getting amortized in the credit-based scheme. So it, it comes down to 480 microseconds, uh, milliseconds, sorry. And the, the hardware latency is still 35, and our outage is 0.81. So clearly an improvement, but it is what it is. But here's the thing that is really interesting. So then we said, since this is just a sleep, what if we said, we are running a super sophisticated algorithm, and it's going to take 350 microseconds to be able to come back with a definitive answer of do I have capacity or do I not have capacity. You see the credit-based scheme starts to pull away because at that point the numbers look almost identical, right? Whereas the lockstep answer becomes way bigger because clearly you're waiting for the time to update to be able to move forward. So nothing, nothing dramatic here. Uh, uh, but just an observation to prove the point that we were trying to make. Clearly, one of the things that is obvious here is that uh, if you make this, have s this update also have some kind of batching capability, then we can hide this 55 into, into 10,000 number, and we'll get a significant speed up there as well. And I think that was the very last, oh, okay. <laughs> 
So conclusions, right? I mean, uh, resource management is non-negotiable for user experience. We hopefully in this in the paper, the paper does a much better job than what I did with the presentation here, but. Um, it makes it clear that there are lots of issues with us not having a clear and consistent answer for resource management. Um, and we, we assert that the credit-based Q scheme will give you way better overall experience. It will hide the hardware latencies better. And it fits in with fairly minimal changes. The current solution that exists, the current stack that exists, can adopt this in a fairly straightforward way and uh, has almost no footprint in the pure software path because it's all hidden behind the notifier set. And uh, if the same principle was applied to the right path, the total latency of these updates can be uh, significantly reduced. So that's all I had. I have three minutes and 22 seconds uh, if anybody has any questions. OK. Uh, two, three, uh, comment. Uh, I just have a comment sure. about uh, the credit-based scheme, an idea that I've seen before that I think would be really useful for hardware vendors to implement is where you get a key with this. When you get a, a response sure. and you get these credits, sure. it comes with a key, and sure. only the, the entity using that key can, can then get those credits and use them. Yeah, you know, so it, it makes sure that they remain there for you and there's no override or something so so uh, not only do I agree with you I actually have some personal experience with this uh, we used to many many years ago and we're, and Dave might actually remember this as well SGI used to use a similar scheme for its NUMA bus on the back end and and we had a very famous problem where at, I think it was at Shell or Exxon Mobile uh, Exxon sorry not mobile um, where on a 2000 node system we were losing credits and it was a seven or eight year bug that stayed on forever because no one could find them. It's like, where the hell did they go? And we don't know who consumed them and we don't know who, what the source and the destinations were, right? So very good point and clearly uh, if, like everything else, if we can make this work well, and, and Cumulus is working on some implementations here, if we can make this work well and make it upstream modeled correctly in software, then I would very shortly expect to see Hardware will be uh, hardware vendors will be able to enhance that with having some kind of cookie key whatever Jamal likes the word cookie so we'll we'll call it a cookie for now. We all love cookies exactly. Uh, I thought Jay had a question over there. So you had mentioned briefly the smart NICs, which are essentially switches inside the card. Does the hardware capabilities of the switches on the cards affect any of these kind of results? So if they're more or less capable, does it change how well or how poorly the scheme works? It's uh, it, like if you consider ACLs as an example, I think the same problem applies, right? Let's say you have two containers. Take, take an example, you have a two container or multi-container network and you're running these containers as credit card transaction endpoints and you have a hard ACL requirement that says at 100 gig speed, I'm using Mac VLAN or Mac VTAP or one of those, or IP VLAN, and I'm sending traffic straight out from, from the switch up into the host, and I need my ACL to be in place, otherwise I'm out of whatever FIPS compliance or whatever other compliance scheme that you have, and you're like, oh, my hardware could silently just drop installing the ACL. I mean, that's a real problem, right? That's that will happen with the smart NIC the way it is currently set up. There is no, there is no feedback loop that is complete. Now, vendors have implemented specific solutions, right? So, so vendors have been clever, but there isn't a consistent Linux answer for that. Can I comment on that? That you're saying that, that Cookies? the TCNDO thing drops packets? Right. You can't comment on that. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we it's, it's break time, so. Yeah. Uh, TCNDO drops packets, that's what you... No, 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 I didn't say drops packets. Dro drops the message. There is no structured response up, right? There is like right. who, who, the caller, who, how are you installing it in a way that you know that this particular thing would not get offloaded completely? Let's say you la ran out of a resource. How do you, how do you have that message? I mean, if you ask for uh, a flow to be offloaded, 
and there is no, and, and the driver rejects. Are you saying the driver won't reject, and you will never How know? Who is asking for the flow to be offloaded is, I guess, question the, the number one. Use, the user, uh, right? Using uh, a TC ad, uh, filter and, and ad, or skip, something. Skip software, or, uh, yeah, w w there's a flag which right. says, so I want you to offload this. If you have a very specific thing, and right. you get an e or something, right. yes, you have the user space capability to go handle it. But let's say it was not that clear, right? Mm -hmm. The tables are in multiple places. The tables have yeah, capacity. I can understand in your match. case you have all this next hop and that a, a route add it implies several tables, not Correct. one. And, and by the way, I mean, TC, the first step in that question is, is TC the only way or the structured way or the su suggested way that people implement ACLs in Linux? If the answer is no, then that right there Th is a That's the driver API, right? No? That's a driver API, yeah. So, OK, maybe we can take this offline. Yeah. Is there any other questions? In the minus one minutes that we have, yeah. No pressure. Yeah, so, so the pre-allocation of credits approach, uh, isn't it, uh, in some use cases, wasting memory because you pre-allocate and you, you end up not using it? So that's up to you. So the way we implemented it, and if you look at the code, you'll see we gave you parameters, right? It gives you the, the queue depth and the credit sort of batch set, if you will. So you decide. If you keep both of those shallow, you'll ask more often, but you will not waste space. If you keep it deep, you will ask less often, but the risk exists that you will fail a transaction because you had 800 entries, but you asked for 1,000, so that's not going to pass. So I think it comes down to you want a high degree of confidence that the hardware program is going to succeed because once it's done asynchronously, you lose that feedback to the user. No. So if something goes wrong, they're not going to know. So that's, that's the whole point of you're, you're doing these reservations just so that you have high degree of confidence it's not going to fail. So, and, and it's a trade-off. Yes. OK, then. Oh, Anjali has a question. So um, just so that you know, Anjali, we are now in the break period, so you're just holding people up from coffee. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to comment that for SmartNext, you know, where the resources are shared between uh, multiple interfaces, this actually becomes really complicated. Yep. Where reservation has its side effect as if, you yep, know, yep. Would, uh, Ajay, sorry, I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, I was saying, but, uh, you know, yeah, keeping it shallow is the key here. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, most hardware, you know, the way it is implemented, it allows you for both uh, upfront reservation as well as, uh, you know, um, reserve as you, as you use kind of uh, model. Yeah, so hi I mean this, like, so in my past life building NICs, right, the hardware typically doesn't care. The only problem with hardware is if you have, if your hardware allocation is slow versus fast. So for example, changing buffering typically requires you to restart your DMA rings, which is very problematic. So doing that dynamically is very hard. However, if you're talking about ACL allocation or, or LPM entries or F FDB entries, you can change them on the fly. And, and what this is really saying is, wh what is being proposed here is that you don't, you take your driver resources and your profiles and you make them bookends, and then how you actually use them actively is a driver decision. This credit return is exactly what the driver is doing. So you decide, right, whether you think more V4, more V6 entries are coming or V4 entries are coming and change how many you think you can take, you can go tell user space that they can safely send you in the next batch. And that's I, it. I think we'll cut the questions here. Well, so thank you. Let's uh, give an applause okay. to. Uh, Wi-Fi working better today? <laughs>